I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. He's speaking to this large crowd that simply wanted another free meal. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Just for a few minutes, I want to just touch on some things that I hope will encourage you and provoke you to thought and gratitude, humility. Because in this, these few verses, there's, there's six things that jump out at me. And I believe will jump out at you. There's first that Jesus, the bread of life, for whoever will believe in him, Second, we see words of hope to those whom the Father has given to Jesus. Third, we see words of hope to whoever comes to him. Then fourth, Jesus came to do the Father's will. Then we see the Father's will from the divine perspective and the Father's will from the human perspective. Just real quickly, look at this. Jesus declares himself to be the bread of life for whoever will believe in him because he says it there, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. See how he links coming to Christ and believing in Christ? That you do in your heart. You don't come to Christ by walking down an aisle. You don't come to Christ by raising a hand. You come to Christ by, in your heart, confessing that he is Lord, believing that God raised him from the dead, and then declaring that from your mouth. It always starts in the heart. And so he tells them in that context, they want something carnal. They want food. They want another miraculous demonstration of his ability to feed them. And he says, it's in the heart, guys. It's in the heart. But he says here, he's the bread of life for whoever will believe in him. That sincere, open offer of the gospel. Whoever will believe in me. Then he chides them. But I said this to you. You've seen me. You've seen what I can do. And still you do not believe. Their, their request for a miracle is not based upon their, their belief that he is the miracle-making Messiah. Their, their request for a miracle is carnal. Still you do not believe in me. The second thing we see is these words of hope to those whom the Father has given to Jesus. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Mystery there. We're looking at that mystery on Sunday nights in, in our study of the doctrines of grace uh, explained in the Gospel of John. No one can unravel this mystery completely, but what it does tell us is that Jesus Christ is victorious in everything he does. We would not follow anyone less than that. We would not commit our lives to anyone less than that. We're not committing our lives to a Savior who tries to save, who wants to save, who hopes he can save. He makes this declaration, these words of hope. If you're a, a Christian here today, if you've been saved by grace through faith, be hopeful. You serve a Savior who declares all that the Father gives me will come to me. He saves and keeps to the end. But there's also words of hope to whoever comes to him. You see. We read those words, and if we're not careful, we'll, we'll begin to think in exclusivity. What we need to learn to do is think about inclusiveness, because folks, here's the reality. Not you, not me, not anyone would have ever come to him had the Spirit not worked in us to do so. So you have this, I want you to see two sides of the same coin. One side says, all that the Father gives me shall come to me. The other side says, and whoever comes, I will not cast away. So some people ask sometimes, well, how do, I, how do I know that I'm one of those given by the Father? Here's the biblical answer. Believe. <laughs> Believe in Christ. It's that simple. There's hope. Hope to whoever comes to him. Hope to those the Father has given him. 
Then he tells us in the fourth place that he came to do the Father's will. Well, that's, so that's obvious, isn't it? It should be. But we don't get to make up what the Father's will was for him. Jesus tells us what the Father's was, will was. Look, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And you remember, we've read through passages of Scripture through the years where he'll say, I can do nothing except the Father who sent me gives it to me to do. I say nothing except what the Father tells me to say. We see a Savior who models for us what complete submission looks like. Not half-hearted, not an occasional, not when it's convenient, whole-hearted, complete submission to the Father. It's staggering when you meditate upon it. He didn't do one thing that the Father did not tell him to do. He didn't say one thing that the Father did not tell him to do. It's complete submission to the Father. This is our Savior. This is our Lord. And so we see in verse 39, the Father's will from the divine perspective. Look at it. I came from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So here's the, here's the thing, folks. Did Jesus do the Father's will? If he did not do the Father's will, what do we call that? What's another word for failing to do the Father's will? Well, it could be the word disobedient, which is sin. So if Jesus didn't do the Father's will. He sinned. And if he sinned, he's not a savior. This is critical for us. This is the Father's will from the, again, the two-sided coin, from the divine perspective. This is the will of him who sent me, verse 39, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Again, if you are saved by grace through faith here today, there is absolutely no way that you can be lost again. That's glorious good news. It's the preservation of the saints, which encourages the saints to persevere, knowing that we can never be lost again. We once were lost, but now we're found. Once we're blind, but now we see. A Savior who saves to the uttermost. Again, did Jesus do this? We're looking at this tonight, by the way, in our, in our study, one of our life groups. Did Jesus do the will of God? Does Jesus get what he pays for? This is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. On the last day, all those given by the Father to Jesus, he will, pre he will present to the Father. Father, you gave me these. They were yours, John 17, that prayer comes into play. And I give them to you. Again, people read that and go, wait, that seems, that seems to be pretty exclusive. There's two sides of this coin, folks. Look at the Father's will from the human perspective. For this is the will of my Father. Now, he's just told us the will of the Father from the divine perspective, that he will lose none. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So here's what happens. We look at these things with our limited human capacity, and we go, ah, oh, that doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense. Well, thank God the gospel doesn't have to make sense to us for it to be true. Amen, right? Yes, thank God. No. Thank God that he didn't say it's by, it's by intellect that you are saved. It's by your divine intellect. It's, it's by having a mental capacity to reach up and lay hold of the mysteries of God. No, it's by simple childlike faith. Simple childlike faith. You see it in your own children. I have... Some, some small grandsons, one three, one about to be three. I promise you this, if we brought them in here right now, stood them on top of this pulpit, and we all got over the shock of a child standing on top of a pulpit, then, and I said, jump. You know what they do? In simple, childlike faith would launch. What they would not do is stand there and go, let's see now, the, what are the physics of this? I weigh X number of pounds, That's, that means gravity's going to fall into place. Grandpa's not as spry as he used to be. He, 
I'm not sure if he can catch me. What if I fall? No, it doesn't, doesn't, no, no. They do it. Faith. And we see this glorious truth. We live, we as Christians live in the, in the, and, and bathe in the wonderful reality that we're saved today because we were given to Jesus by the Father in eternity past and the Spirit came in the fullness of time and saved us and we cannot be lost again. And then we look upon those whom we long to be saved, perhaps family members, friends, uh, distant relatives, fellow workers. We say, oh Lord, can they be saved? Whoever, everyone in verse 40, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life and I will raise Him up at the last day. And here's what I submit to you, that these two sides to the same coin constitute a great context in which to have wonderful hope and confidence that Jesus saves to the uttermost and wonderful hope and confidence that we can give the gospel. We can take the gospel to anyone, anytime, anywhere, and press upon them the reality of Jesus dying and rising again and saying to them with, with evangelical truth, and if you will trust in him, you will be saved. If you will repent of your sin and call upon Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Because the bread of life says so. Maybe someone here today. You're not yet a Christ follower. A child, an adult. Unbelief doesn't have any age limitations to it. And I can say to you, with gospel authority, that if you will look unto Jesus Christ and believe in Him, Believe him to be who we have declared he is, and all we've done is declared who he declares himself to be. We're not making this up here. If you will look to him and believe in him, you will be saved. And if you have been saved by grace through faith, no matter how hard life comes upon you, presses upon you, no matter how far you may wander astray at some point in your life, if you've ever been saved by grace through faith, you will be brought back to him. You will be kept by him. You will never fall away. Never. Glorious truth given by the bread of life. So here it is, and we close with this. What am I? I'm just a beggar who's found bread. We're beggars who found bread. You remember the story of the Syrian lepers in the Old Testament? Their city was besieged by a foreign army. They were sitting outside the gate because that's where lepers belong. They didn't belong inside the city. They thought to themselves, what are we going to do? The siege was going some time now. People in the city were not eating unless they turned to cannibalism to eat themselves. And the lepers said, what shall we do? If we go inside the city, we're going to die. Let's go to the army. The worst they can do is kill us. And so they went to beg for bread. When they got there, remember the story? God had miraculously come in the night, come in, the, in a wind with voices and confused the army. And they had, they had slain one another and had fled in utter fear, believing they had been hit with a surprise attack by the army of the city. And it was all the doing of God. And so these lepers walk into this camp. And not a living soul is there. And they look around in disbelief and initially they go into tent after tent and they see bread aplenty, food aplenty, booty to be carried off and sold. They begin to gather it up and, and think about how they can hoard this and where they can store it. And one of them says, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not doing right. We eat to our fill while those in the city perish from starvation. This is a day when good news should be heralded forth. The news that we found bread and we sin by holding our peace, by keeping it to ourselves. Brothers and sisters, this is the day of good news. Jesus Christ, the bread of life, has made himself available to us saying take 
Believe in me, you'll never hunger. Believe in me, you'll never thirst. And yet we move in and out of a society that is so hungry, it'll eat anything. So thirsty, it'll do anything. We must not hold our peace. We must go from this place as beggars who found bread, saying to other beggars who are still starving, oh, let me tell you about the bread of life who will feed you that you want no more. As we celebrate Jesus, let's take the celebration to those who have no reason to celebrate. Introduce to them the Savior of sinners who saved us, who will keep us, who is coming again. He declares, what I've just done with you tonight in this upper room, I will not do again until I have gathered all of you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's go. Take the good news. Jesus died for sinners and rose again from the grave. He has saved me. He will save you if you'll believe in him. Let's pray.